So welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming so early in the morning to this session about smart drugs and what would happen <laughs> if we are all in a future where we're taking smart drugs. Um, I was surprised myself, uh, apparently. <laughs> a lot of my colleagues at university would have been taking smart drugs, and I wasn't aware of it. It says up to 14% of people now are taking a smart drug every day. Um, I find these figures surprising. So we're going to talk to the panel about the world where we might be taking uh, Ritalin every day and whether that's a good thing, what that means for society. And to be honest, we've just been having a discussion in the green room. <laughs> and I just want to get it started because it was very lively. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to welcome Nita Farahani, who's joining us. She is the director of Duke Science and Society. She's also a professor of law and philosophy at Duke University. Uh, Andrew Thompson, to my left. He's co-founder of Proteus Health, which is uh, designing sense and ingestible medicines that talk to your smartphone. So this could be a real kind of smart drug. He's also the founder of Summit Schools. Uh, we have to my right, Daniel Bell. So Daniel is the Dean of the School of Political Science and Public Policy at Shangdong University. He's also considered an expert in Confucianism, <laughs> allegedly. Confucianism and he's, is supposed to be modest. So yeah, sorry. <laughs> and he's the author of The China Model. And we are joined by Dr. Thomas Senderovitz, who's the Director General of the Danish Medicines Agency. He's also the European Head of the EMA. Um, I'd like to start with you, Nita. Can you Great. kick off our discussion? Every panelist will have five minutes. We'd like to encourage as much audience participation as possible. So please just, if, even if you're behind me, just put your hand up and we'll get a microphone to you to ask some questions. Uh, Nita, safe to say that you're pro smart drugs. Yeah, I think uh, I'm pro people having the choice to take smart drugs, um, which I think is different than pro smart drugs. I, I'm indifferent really uh, on smart drugs versus other kinds of um, safe, potentially effective types of things that people can take. I think that smart drugs are not particularly different than most of the other things that we um, already do to improve our health. Um, I think generally what we try to do as humans is to improve, uh, whether it's to improve our health through the latest diet to exercise, which has been shown to uh, probably be the most effective way to improve cognition and to improve health, um, or to ingest so-called smart drugs. Um, I personally, uh, under the prescription and advice of a physician uh, under all circumstances, <laughs> um, have tried pretty much anything that I can try, right? right. So whether it's modafinil or any other kind of smart drug, I've I tried mean, them. Pausing there, I've, I've, I forgot, I should ask the audience, how many people here have actually, if you want to disclose, <laughs> have taken a smart drug or know somebody who's taken a smart drug, shall we say? And a smart drug is, could you classify what are a few of the ones, modafinil, Ritalin? Yeah, so I mean, I think people, nootropics is a kind of bigger class of, um, of what people think of smart drugs, but there are supplements that people think improve cognition and, and enhancements uh, of different uh, kinds of skills that you might have. It might be memory, it might be your um, uh, concentration, uh, your alertness, um, your ability to think quickly through a problem. Uh, but some of those drugs are modafinil, which is uh, pro-vigil or new vigil. Um, the whole class of drugs that are prescribed for ADHD or ADD, which are things like Ritalin or Concerta or Vyvanse, these are some of the um, names, and those are stimulant kind of drugs. Mm. Um, and then, of course, there are non-prescription drugs that uh, people take as well, ginkgo biloba, um, other kinds of herbal remedies that people believe will enhance cognition or memory or things like that. So how many um, people here have taken any of those kind of drugs and know somebody who's taken those drugs? Yep. Well, we shouldn't leave out, you know, caffeine, wow. which I bet everybody here has taken, <laughs> right? Caffeine. Which is one of the ones that are the most ubiquitous, yeah. you know, But not used. needing a prescription yet. Well, not, uh, not needing a prescription, although there are much higher doses of caffeine that you yeah. can get in distilled form, yeah. right? Rather than, I mean, not just nootropics, you can go in the U.S. into a gas station and get no dose or other kinds of um, distilled caffeine that are much right. higher doses of caffeine than you can get in a cup of coffee or in your espresso or latte that you might drink. Interesting. So, yeah. Okay, so Andrew, can you explain a bit about your company? Because you're doing a totally different sort of smart drug, I would say. Well, yes and no. Mm. Um, so let's, let's draw on this idea that um, the way you enhance your cognition is by um, your diet, your medicines, exercise, rest. So let's just then talk about how a digital medicine can be part of how you uh, really massively enhance your ability to make smart choices. So a digital drug is a drug that contains a sensor inside it that's the size of a poppy seed uh, that's made from ingredients in your regular diet. When you swallow a digital medicine, maybe a drug to uh, um, treat your heart disease, uh, it's going to turn on and uh, create a signal in your body. That signal can be detected by a little wearable device. We use a patch that's like a super Fitbit. 
detects your medicines, but it measures your physiology, so things like your heart rate and your respiration, and it tracks your activities of daily life, so we can track your rest, your rest architecture, and your activity, and other things that show how well you are. It sends that information to your mobile phone, and then you've got information about what you're doing with your medicines and how you're living your life, and that can then be put into the cloud, and if you choose, you can share that with your family or your care team and other people who are trying to help you. Mm. Why is that important? What we've shown in randomized clinical trials, uh, which are the gold standard, of course, for how you measure the effect of a medical product, um, if you give us patients who've got high blood pressure, high blood sugar, and high lipids, these are the global pandemics, they're everywhere. If you give us those patients who have all failed drug therapy, They've been on drug for at least six months and they have failed all endpoints. And you put them on a digital version of the same drugs where they take them, they get feedback, they can share that feedback if they want to with people in their care team. Then within 90 days, 98% of those patients are at their blood pressure goal. Zero to 98%. With major drops in their lipids and significant drops in their blood sugar. This is extraordinary. What's going on here? we're enhancing these patients' ability to make wise, healthy choices. Mm -hmm. How do we do that? The simplest human psychology possible. Measurement, feedback, and behavioral cues. Mm. This is how people learn good habits. And by the way, if you start making good choices, and you rest your body, and you get exercise, and you take your medicines, you'll keep making good, healthy choices. These are the ultimate smart drugs. And would you say taking a non-prescription Ritalin dose to do better at school or increase your concentration? Is that a good So decision? I think the framing of this about things like Ritalin, Ritalin may or may not be a good idea. At the end of the day, food is a drug. For example, if you get uh, very little sleep, you are much more likely to have carbohydrate cravings. And carbohydrates affect your serotonin system. Your brain is basically a giant uh, chemical and electrical um, device, and how you feed it and how you nurture it affects how you make decisions. So you can choose to feed and nurture your brain with chemistry and with chemical compounds, or you can treat, choose to feed and nurture your brain by making good decisions about rest and exercise. Mm -hmm. And so what I would tell you is, as um, uh, Nita has pointed out, 100% of us are already doing this. We're making decisions about coffee, about donuts, uh, about uh, 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 exercise, about how we rest, and these are fundamental to our brain health and our capacity to make smart decisions. And so what I'm going to say to you is, this is not the new norm, this is the norm. Right. Uh, and what I would encourage people to do is to actually make good and wise decisions and actually to use, if you're um, in any way prescribed the medicine, a digital medicine, these are commercial products now in the US, thousands of people using them today, uh, this absolutely within 10 years will be the norm. Every patient will have the chance to know when they use a medicine, whether it's real, whether it's fake, whether it's the right dose, whether it's the wrong dose, whether they take it at the right time or the wrong time, mm. whether it works for them and how it affects their activities of daily life. And that is absolutely crucial to people making smart decisions and having good cognition. I mean, Daniel, does this speak to you? Do, do any of your students use these sort of drugs, do you know? Um, Might be difficult to tell, I guess. I don't think they would tell me if they do, but I'm just trying to think as an, an educational administrator in China, what would be the relevant principle? And I think the relevant principle would be what effect it has on the ideal of equality of opportunity mm -hmm. in education. Because this ideal is widely held in China. It goes way back to the time of Confucius, who famously said, Yo jiao wu lei, which means that in, edu in education there are no social classes. He would take any student, regardless of their background, if they have the ability and the willingness to learn. And today in China, the one, um, well, there's, there's an, there's, it, the National University Entrance Examination is mm. called the Gao Kao. And it's so important in terms of determining a people's future in China. And it's based on this ideal of equality of opportunity in education. And arguably, it's the least corrupt institution in China. Well, sorry, let, let me <laughs> okay. put it. It's the most fair, um, the most <laughs> fair uh, institution in China. And also, it's central, to be frank, to the political legitimacy of, of the whole government. Because it's, if, it, if that institution is questioned as, as being unfair, it would, really, it would really undermine this whole ideal of meritocracy, which is central not just to education, but to politics in China. And do you think students taking smart drugs might make that seem unfair? It, it would. If, it, if, if those drugs are expensive, mm -hmm. and they're only taken by those from wealthy backgrounds, it would really send this message that if you don't have to study hard, if you just take those drugs, you can do better on the examinations, and that would really undermine the legitimacy of the whole system. So I think if the drugs are expensive or available only to a powerful minority and difficult to access, then I think, I, I do honestly think they should be rigorously 
you know, banned and, and they should be tested for is before these, this national entrance examination, just like we test athletes in the Olympics to, you know, because steroids seem to give them an unfair advantage. Mm -hmm. But if the drugs can help poor people or marginalized people and give them a more equal opportunity, because now the big problem is that if you're from a wealthy family, you can access better teachers and so on, you can be better, better prepared for the uh, entrance examinations. But if those drugs can help poor and marginalized people and give them more equal opportunity, then I can see there might be a case for that. Mm. But, but that would be difficult to, to police. I, I'm course. guessing you would no. stop the rich kids from having well, it. So if, they're, if it's as accessible as coffee, coffee is yes. cheap and widely accessible yes. and doesn't have serious side effects taking mm. moderate dosage, then fine. Yeah. But until that day, I think they should be, uh, to be frank, rigorously, you know, they um, almost banned, to be well, frank, in China. That's interesting because this is the issue that we're talking about as well, is how much do we know about the side effects of these drugs, and are they actually smart drugs? Are these actually having an effect, Dr. Sanders? I, I would like to call them dumb drugs. <laughs> okay. Probably not really call them drugs. <laughs> yeah. Because as, as we've discussed prior to the session, the, I'm, a, I'm a regulator, so basically the whole regulatory framework looks as, does medicine help treating patients? And in here, we have to assume, well, some of those uh, people taking them might be patients, but most of them would otherwise be healthy. So the, this is about enhancement of otherwise normal functions. I guess mm. that's what we're talking about. That's Not right. in your case of, of what I think is really smart, and I do agree that that might very well be the future. So the question is, do we have a framework which allows us to make decisions? But I have to say, we also regulate food, which we, which mm -hmm. we ingest. And I think, from coming from a, as a regulator, my job is to make sure that generally the public health doesn't suffer. Mm. Uh, you know, we should make free choices, and of course, but we should make sure that we, we don't want to sell cigarettes to underage, right? We want to make sure that public health doesn't suffer. So coming back to these so-called drugs, if they're, and some of them are real drugs, they are intended to treat patients. Yes. I like to see some data showing that they actually work, and it's quite limited, at least by my standards, that they actually do anything good. Mm. It will require very large controlled trials to show that you're improving cognition and performance in randomized controlled trials, and therefore I'm not as supportive of these being widely used. If we have those data, of course, mm. uh, and if they, have, if they are safe to use, well, I haven't seen big safety data studies yet. To, some of them might not be problematic. Some of those that are used today, uh, particularly those that are prescription drugs for ADHD, mm. uh, Ritalin, uh, Ritalin for instance, are absolutely not for public, general public use sure. in my opinion. Because what kind of effects would these drugs have if I started taking them and I don't have ADHD? Well, if you take a look at the, uh, the, the package insert for, for Ritalin, for instance, there are all kinds of potential side effects, including changes in blood pressure and psychological changes. Mm. And, and youngsters taking those to school shouldn't take that without control. Mm. And now, of course, you are, you are less likely to have severe heart disease when you're 20 than when you're 50 or 60. But then again, you know, we can't just say they're only for youngsters. If you let it go, it's for everyone. So I do believe that there are some, some caveats around this. I, uh, and and that's, a, that's, more, that's a health discussion. It's also a philosophical and ethical discussion. Yeah. Should we be able to choose freely? I'm personally very much against cigarettes being a legal uh, thing. I think we should ban cigarettes. It's damaging to public health. Mm. Should we be able to choose that freely? So that's a philosophical discussion. I can see Nita smiling because I know. <laughs> I disagree, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, let, let me back up for a moment, which is just to clarify the difference of the kinds of drugs we're talking about first, which sure. is there's two very different kinds of smart drugs that we're talking about, right? One is a drug that acts on your chemistry of you know, your brain and your body to change something, whether it's to speed up the processing of information or to make you more alert. The second is to enable you to have much greater information about how a pill works, how your body works, how your physiology of your body works. And so it's um, you know, being able to do something like uh, quantify the body and the information from your body. Uh, and you know, they may have very different implications for how we think about those kinds of smart drugs, which is smart in terms of making you smarter about your health and your body versus mm -hmm. smart as in doing something to, uh, rather than through information, more directly mediate your body. Uh, but, um, and so they may have different regulatory responses to it. I'm going to focus on the latter, which is drugs like caffeine or, um, you know, Ritalin and Concerta and those types of drugs, uh, and say, I wholeheartedly disagree that we should ban these drugs uh, from individual use. And part of it is we're just not used to being able to regulate this class of stuff, mm. right? This class of stuff, which are not about treating illness but about enhancing our bodies and ourselves. And so the traditional way that you look at drugs and um, devices, you say, what's the safety and what's the efficacy? And for efficacy, 
it's a totally different ball game to say, do you get a personal benefit out of it? And how you value that information, right? The benefit that you get out of it versus the safety, as opposed to does it actually treat the drug that it's supposed to treat? So if I have a placebo effect, if I believe that it enhances my um, cognition, if I believe that it makes me more weak and more likely to be alert, um, and the risk of it is I may get a headache or my blood pressure may go up, mm. and I don't have any pre existing conditions that would put me at greater risk because of having a slightly higher blood pressure, I think I absolutely should have the right to choose that rather than a regulator deciding it's not effective enough. Because effective enough is a personal decision, yeah. not a regulator's decision in this context. But a personal decision based on what? Because some Based on my own personal values, right? Mm. Which is, if my personal values are, I would rather take the drug than go for a run this morning, or I have terrible jet lag. Here I am in China on a 12-hour time difference, and modafinil can help me reset my clock so that I am more awake and more alert, and I personally derive benefit out of that. Um, then I don't think that a regulator has the right calculus to be able to say, it's not effective enough to make you alert. It's not effective enough to make you wide awake enough or cognitively inclined enough because that's a personal experience which is not well measured by our traditional regulatory approaches. Yeah. Right. Um, if the drugs are expensive and they improve examination performance, yes. you wouldn't worry about them? Um, so that's, a, that's not a question for me of banning regulation. That's a question of distribution of goods and services, and that's a question that we face with everything in society, right? I mean, who has access to tutors? Who has access to television and um, applications that improve? And, and these are real justice questions in society. So if it turns out that there's really good data that improves performance, um, and we have a model of justice that distributes goods more widely that we think do that, then we should distribute it more widely and enable greater access to it, not ban access to um, you know, the people who can afford it today. I think, I think it's a separate question, but an important question, right? An important question about just the, the just distribution of goods and services. Can I just build on Please. some of the things that Nita said? So, um, I don't think these ideas are actually completely separate. Okay. And I'll, I'll give you an idea of this. So um, there are obviously drugs that have been approved that maybe, maybe don't enhance cognition. Okay. Um, we did some experiments around the effects of using uh, behavioral cues, measurement feedback, uh, uh, on how it would affect uh, people and, and how they live. And so we gave people placebo pills and we called them motivation pills. Yeah. And the idea was that if you, you set your, for example, diet, exercise, your goals, your personal goals, right? And in the morning, when you were supposed to go for a run, if you felt like you might not, you could take a motivational pill, mm -hmm. right? And you could take as many as you liked. And what we showed in that study was that people with motivation pills were more motivated. And the more <laughs> motivational pills you took, the more motivated you were, okay. which yeah. is a yeah. classic placebo yeah. effect. And yeah. by the way, placebo effects have been around for a very long time. Yeah. And they are actually increasing in society. And yeah. so, okay... This is a very, very important point because um, uh, the chemistry of the brain is linked yes. to much, much more than just the, 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 the chemistry that's in the pill. Agreed. Right? So that's but a it's, really... it's a neurofeedback approach, yes. right, as opposed to... I, I was trying to distinguish, just I, I to be it. clear, right, which is neurofeedback, there's a lot of good data that neurofeedback yes. actually improves cognition as well. And yes. the mm. mechanism of the smart pill that you were talking about uh, really is, is neurofeedback. Right, yeah. right. But, but, but if you use neurofeedback with the right chemicals, you're going to sort of... You're enhancing the chemicals. So let's then yes. go to this point about <laughs> education, about do I worry about, do, do, should people worry um, about, um, uh, about these kinds of things? Uh, for what it's worth, and obviously this isn't a debate about education, but educational systems around the globe in the 21st century are pretty horrendous, right? And so uh, the issues in education are miles beyond whether kids can get access to caffeine or Ritalin. Um, uh, there are much more basic questions like can they good, get access to decent teachers? Mm. And so um, I, I would really, really reframe that and say anything that we can do to perform the, uh, uh, or improve the performance of any child in any country and uh, get ahead in an increasingly uh, uh, educationally intensive and knowledge intensive world is a really, really good thing. And focusing on um, not allowing that until everyone can get access would be a huge problem. Oh, it, it depends who uses them. Though. If it's the rich students who already mm -hmm. have all these advantages, then it's something to worry about. 
but if, the, if they're cheap and available to all and they help those who are from underprivileged backgrounds, then we should encourage Yeah, but a mental yeah. model that just talks about the rich like that's a static thing is a problem. The 20 most wealthy people in America all made their money in their own lifetime and most of them started out poor. So this notion that you can talk about the rich they're, like they're a static class is just a fundamental misnomer. And every young kid, wherever they are, any country in the world deserves a crack and I'm in favor of any way that they can get it. But does it say something about our society that we're trying to enhance our concentration in this manner, that we're increasingly trying to make it more competitive. Does that worry any of you? So, so just uh, to, to answer that in just a nuance, mm. I mean, regulators' job is not to ban anything. Sure. I just want to make that <laughs> very clear. <laughs> it's, it's actually the opposite, to make available uh, stuff that helps. And I'm struggling with understanding how much they help. Yeah. I do acknowledge yeah. that you feel that you're helped, yeah. and that could very well be the placebo effect. Yeah. And I also want to, just for the nuance, sake of nuance, saying there's a difference between caffeine and Ritalin. Right, I, we really need to understand the continuum of rather uh, undangerous uh, substances that are close to placebo, which might very well help, and stuff that potentially could be harmful. Mm. So at least if we are applying it to the masses, I think it should not be harmful. Mm. And I'm yeah. missing for part of those so-called smart drugs, I will refer to them as dumb drugs, mm. um, they are harmful, or at least I'm, I'm missing enough uh, um, demonstration about the potential harm. I do realize that we can't apply the same framework, so that's just about getting the nuances right. Mm, yeah. Then back to the other question about uh, the rich and poor, that becomes philosophy, which is yeah. out completely outside the realm of a simple regulator. Sure. <laughs> so, I, I mean, on, on the, the point of um, banning, fair enough, right? I mean, there are alternatives, but it's, I don't think the case that everything that we do has to have some sort of therapeutic benefit. Take cosmetic surgery. Right, breast augmentation, um, but do you rhinoplasty. Think those are positive things for people to be doing. If people want to do them, go for it. From my perspective, and they, you know, they have significant risk associated with them, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, their anesthesia risk, their surgery risk. There's all kinds of risks that are associated with them. And Tattoos have risks to yeah. them. You know, the health risks and the consequences, and yet we allow people to, you know, adorn their ears and adorn their bodies with tattoos allowing, and art. Do you think it is a free choice? Because things like breast augmentation is that maybe something that society is putting on some women that they think right, they so I know you want that. to go here. So let's go here for a yeah, moment, which is, here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which is the kind of race to the bottom, right? Yeah. So people, people are really worried that when you have available drugs, um, that the implication for society is that the only way that you can keep up is by taking the drugs, yeah. right? And, um, and in some ways, you know, it's true. If you have a very effective thing in society for improving performance and improving cognition and improving your ability to stay awake and be productive, um, there is a pressure to use them. People mm. now almost all use computers, right? People, uh, the distribution of cell phones throughout uh, society is quite large. The use of the internet to do research, um, the use of email for communication, for rapid response to communication, it has changed fundamentally society. Mm. Uh, and people have had to keep up, right? You can't now send snail mail to somebody. Uh, you have to actually send emails, which means that the rapidity of communications has ri risen. Is that Drugs, positive? Is that a positive? Well, I mean, it's, it's true. Whether it is positive mm. or not positive, it is true, which is society and humanity is always looking for ways to improve. And the question is, is a life in which we are able to be more alert have longer and better memories, um, are able to be less anxious in certain situations, is that a better life? Mm. Um, and but those why are use deeply... drugs when you could use meditation, you could practice Qigong, you could use well, and all some kinds of, of And different... some of those are actually better. So neurofeedback mm. is more effective in many instances than most of these drugs are. Um, using meditation has been more effective for calming than most of the different drugs that are out there. So these aren't mutually exclusive. They're all part of a continuum and all options that are available for enhancement. And not everybody will use them. And not everybody should use them. There are side effects. For some people, they don't work. For some people, they don't enjoy them or they don't want to change themselves in those ways. I don't believe that there's going to be an imposed requirement, mm -hmm. but I do believe it should be part of the options available to people to choose. I mean, it's interesting, the imposed requirement, because I've read recently there's been some experiments between the Beijing to Shanghai Railway where mm -hmm. conductor, um, train drivers are wearing these kind of yep. caps. Yeah. Uh, so basically, they're monitoring their concentration as they're driving. Right. Pro or anti this panel? <laughs> Is this a good development to monitor workers while they're? 
I worry about that a lot. Right. Actually. Right. I worry about something different, and it's actually two sides of the same coin, which is I think we have a right to cognitive liberty, right? Um, and that cognitive liberty is the right to self-access, which you're really working on, which is terrific. Mm -hmm. It's the right to self-determination, um, and it's the right to some freedom of thought mm -hmm. and, to, and mental privacy. And, and what, the, what I worry the most about is when we're tracking yes. what's happening in people's heads, um, particularly workers, truck drivers, people who um, don't have the option to opt out, uh, that the, um, the better that information gets, the closer it gets to being able to decode things like visual imagery or thoughts, which we're still a long way away from, um, but the closer we get to that, mm. the more problematic it becomes as people need to censor their thoughts and as you know, we I, intervene. I, I don't worry about it as much. I mean, the main task of a train uh, driver, so to speak, or conductor is, is to safety. And if, those, if that helps improve safety, then mm. that should be the main. But what happens if it goes down the track that it, they can enhance their uh, performance at work by giving them a smart drug, measuring the impact on the brain? They can work longer hours. Yeah, um, I think, personally, look, this is a, a real red herring from my perspective. Mm -hmm. um, if you just think about where we are from a transportation perspective, um, uh, we have trains, we have cars, we now have self-driving cars. Sure. Um, if you really want to get out there, I, you can go see videos of self-flying planes. In fact, you don't just need mm -hmm. to see videos. What people should know is that most planes today are flown without Absolutely. pilots. The pilots sit there and the plane flies itself. Yeah. If you want to use uh, these kinds of uh, uh, technical advancements to make things safer, you don't need to monitor the pilot or the train driver. You need to use the technology in the train. Mm. And so uh, that's yeah. not a, a, an interesting... But they're using it for truck drivers. They're using it for factory workers. Electricity company workers. Yeah, yeah, yeah I but, mean, and, but I, I, and you make a point about cognitive liberty, but I, I would just say, look, I, I, not only is it just about cognitive liberty, it's not a good strategy if you want to promote safety so in a workplace. get rid of the workers uh, and get the self-driving Technology. Uh, well, so I, I just think that there are many, many other much more effective ways uh, to effectively use machines to augment human effectiveness mm -hmm. rather than using um, technology to check on whether human beings are being effective. I think that's actually the wrong pathway. It's just intellectually it's, the, it's, the wrong it's approach. It's a technical question, whatever works, right? I mean, we agree that there's a trade-off sometimes between liberty and safety. And if, if you can have more safety without fundamentally undermining liberty, then, and if that's the most effective way of doing it, then mm -hmm. I don't see a problem. But you're, so I'm just going to be a little bit provocative. So in reality, <laughs> to have that liberty to, to make choices, why should we regulate anything at all? Yeah. Right, yeah. so that's really the question. So, <laughs> so let's just all take rocks, and whether they kill us yeah. or not, whether they work or not, we really couldn't I'm care. I'm all for improving safety profiles, but yeah, if you want to go there. Um. So, so, I, <laughs> so, so I see that's a continuum, basically. So. Yeah. So who cares whether you get uh, def deficient birth deficiencies when you take medicine when you're pregnant? Who cares no, about I, that? So, yeah. We go so right back to the thalidomide it. scandal. And, yeah. and right, so basically that's not a problem. As long as we feel good, we can just take it. No. So I, I'm tongue-in-cheek, right? And you're right, you're being provocative. I'm not saying that we should liberalize everything. <laughs> Although you could probably push me to that point it's for some things. But I, I want safety and efficacy data in the same way that you know, I want the quantified self and the ability to improve health by empowering individuals and empowering consumers. <laughs> I think that regulators empower consumers by forcing information. Right? And I think the forcing of information is incredibly valid. And there are certain things, like you, put, you know, point out thalidomide. We're talking about implications not just for the self, right, but for future generations. Um, and you know, should I uh, be able to take drugs that would affect an unborn child that would lead to birth defects forever? If I don't have that information, and I, then I can't make that choice. I can't make an educated choice. And society pays a great deal. Your point is an interesting one because you know, you've implicitly said it, but we should make it more explicit. It's the difference between some of the Western and Eastern bioethical right. approaches, mm. right. right? which is the emphasis on the individual versus the emphasis on the community. Right. Um, right. And you would lead to pretty different outcomes right. and exactly. intuitions right. about right. what would happen. Right. So but at the end but, of the day, it does depend on, on one's, we can call it, as you said, justice, but also philosophy of the good life. And, I think the, the more, I mean, we can call it the Confucian view that the good life lies in having harmonious social relations. I mean, that would lead to somewhat different views uh, compared to the more libertarian view that right. might be more prominent in the U.S. Yeah. I'm just going to open it up to some questions. Uh, can I grab that microphone? Yep, go ahead. Could you just introduce yourself and where you're from? Yeah, so hi. Can you hear me? Is it working? Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Hi, my name is Sri Subramanian. I am from the University of Sussex in the U.K. Um, so my question is, the, 
somehow these drugs and smart drugs or smart substances, chemical, whatever we take, imply that the person is intelligent enough to know what they're doing. Um, and this intelligence is not pervasive. Uh, so what can we do to educate people about the process? If you don't want to regulate, at least we need, reg we need to educate people about what is good, what is safe use, what is not safe use. Even for caffeine, we have some understanding or notion of what is safe limits. Uh, who should take them, who should not take them as well. Yeah. Uh, how do we manage that process? Thank you. So I'll give it a yeah. shot at least. Well, that, that first assumes that those who manufacture these and produce these are willing to accept the system by which they generate these kind of data, right, that we have a framework. I do agree that the current framework for, us, for assessing this is geared towards patients and not towards otherwise healthy trying to enhance. So there might be a, a value in looking into a moderating or a developing a framework, a regulatory framework. I'm all for that we take these things. I'm not, again, I'm not banning anything, but I want data. <laughs> I want to know, in fact, that they do enhance intelligence. Mm. I have not seen a lot of trials basically telling like us that they enhance head, Can, I, can I challenge you on that? I really want to challenge you on that. <laughs> I, I, on this debate about regulation, <laughs> there is a, a <laughs> very clear public <laughs> health <laughs> argument that says yeah, yeah, safety is very important. <laughs> but the notion that regulators demand to know whether things are efficacious, in my view, is somewhat spurious because right. many, many drugs have very, very different effects in many different people. Today, efficacy means you have a 5% signal across a population that a drug works. I speculate if you had six fingers, it would be a 6% signal. It's a very shaky, in my view, way in which to gate access for, yeah. for populations to products and services that they may wish to buy. If they're safe, right. I don't see why you need to have any data about whether uh, uh, people so, in so. this room so think they work. So just Nicola here was shaking her head when you guys were talking. I just want to get... No, I just had a, a couple of comments. I'm a neuroscience professor. The first <laughs> is I wanted you... No one's really defined what you mean by smart drug. Yeah. And I think most of the evidence is it's perhaps increasing your focus on a particular task. Yeah. And we're not really talking about increasing intelligence. Right. That's yeah. what you have. The second comment is, it's all very well as an adult, you might decide I want to yeah. take this, this is my decision, but we're talking probably about children here when the brain is still developing. So mm -hmm. I think that's a very different thing yeah. if you're making a long-term change to their brain development. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. And I think it's, uh, when I say that I think it's we should good. make it available to people, I really mean adults. Um, I think, oh. you know, there are- So we're regulating the age at least. Uh, yeah, so we can I'm happy to hear that we can go that <laughs> well, far. And, and yeah, for safety. some things, right? I mean, uh, you know, everything we do with children changes their brain. Neurofeedback changes their brain. You know, there's mm -hmm. lots of things that people are doing at home, reading to their children that changes their brain in good ways and in bad ways. And so we can't regulate everything we do with children. But raising, um, reading to children doesn't raise their blood pressure or lead to any other kind of... Right, but so, so this is why safety is so important. But I wholeheartedly agree so, that when so, we're talking so about guys, this class... I mean, why do you need efficacy data? H hang on for a second, just to, just for sure. <laughs> just for sure. We're so, not, we're of course, efficacy in the old-fashioned blockbuster ways is being challenged by precision medicine. Yes. A yes, big topic yes. here. Indeed. So we don't disagree. However, it is nonsense just to talk about safety. No drug is safe, first of all. It's all about the balance of benefit yeah. versus risk. And right, you, can't you can't talk, you can't that talk about safety <laughs> without really seeing the relationship to the benefit. You know, are you willing to take a chemotherapy mm -hmm. medicine for your headache? No, you're not. You're willing to take it if you have cancer. So, of course, it's mm. in the context. Yeah. In this context, and I wholeheartedly agree, uh, is it beneficial to give adolescents or kids something that can enhance their, their brain? And why do we regulate for kids? And, and how do we know that there are no long-term harm for, for stronger enhancers? So that's my point. Mm. How you measure efficacy and whether that's done good enough, of course, that's a separate discussion for another session we can take later on. But that's also work. That's also improving in the regulatory field yep. by the introduction yep. of precision medicine. I want to take a couple more questions. So, Gemma, you well, like hi. Yes, um, I'm based in the UK, where we have the NHS, um, the wonderful NHS, and um, so obviously a, a lot of the prescription drugs are free or very low cost. Um, and it just kind of this discussion. You know, you're talking about placebo effects. It kind of made me think a little bit about homeopathy. And um, you know, it's, there's huge campaigns in the UK to ban the the NHS prescription homeopathy because there's no evidence for it. Um, so how do you make a decision as to whether you should publicly fund drugs that we don't necessarily have data on, um, mm -hmm. even if they might have public good and therefore make it fair? Thank you. That's a wonderful and such a hard question. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's a great question, which is, um, you know, public funding decisions when you're talking about scarce resources, um, here's where you know, you probably do want some efficacy data, right? Because safety data uh, without any data that says what it does uh, or if it does what it does 
um, doesn't justify funding. And then, of course, you come to the problem of, okay, so now you have something that uh, their popular belief improves cognition. Um, and to your point, right now it doesn't increase intelligence, although there's some question with modafinil as to whether or not it does improve performance IQ. Um, and, uh, you know, so there's a, a widespread popular belief that it improves cognition, but there's no data that it does. Does it justify public funding of it? Probably not. Right, because in a in a choice of scarce resources, you're going to focus on health before you're going to focus on enhancements. You know, in the same way that we don't uh, fund other elective kinds of cosmetic surgeries, right. we're not going to fund other kinds of elective choices to enhance yourself either, unless there is a therapeutic benefit to it. Just like, I, I, go on, Dan. Which makes just, the unfairness problem. You know, yes. it's not a public health question though. Then, right? It is a it's a different question yes. about not whether or not the public health system supports it, because if it's not about health. Right, if enhancement is about an elective choice, there are other government functions that aren't just health-based functions for distributions of goods and resources, just like education. Right? And again, you'd want efficacy data. You'd want mm -hmm. efficacy to say, like, we know education so, works. Do drugs work? So, uh, I'm, I'm so go on, Dan. Just in a, in a Chinese context, I'm just, I remember this national examination for, at the university is so important in terms of shaping people's future mm -hmm. career. And there you can get, it seems to me it wouldn't be hard to get efficacy data, you know. If taking the drug improves the concentration, helps examination performance versus those who don't, you can mm -hmm. easily measure that. And, and, and once with that data, one, one could take a decision depending on one's view of justice. I'm just going to bring in a few more questions. So Hannah, you had a question? Yeah. I'm Hannah from New Zealand. Um, my question kind of coming back to, so if smart drugs are as common as coffee, um, there's been a lot of talk at this conference about how the skills that we need the, for the future are creativity, innovation, like deep critical thinking. Um, and it appears to me that a lot of these drugs just enhance you to do things faster and quicker, mm. but not necessarily in that deep yeah. critical thinking skills that we need. Um, so I'm just curious about what, if you think smart drugs are effective, where is this going? Is there something that can enhance that side? Of things. I think that's a really, really interesting point myself. Um, one of the things that I believe is happening and has certainly happened in the United States is that fast intelligence is greatly overvalued and slow intelligence is greatly undervalued. And what I mean by that is that things that require really deep thought, knowledge and flow take much more time than answering multi, multi, uh, multiple choice uh, questions and tests. And so um, I think that's a problem in many aspects, for example, the American educational system, where people who are very, very, very capable, but who maybe have uh, slow intelligence and don't do well in fast test environments, are grossly discriminated against. And I think that's um, a problem in many modern systems. Uh, anecdotally, um, it is believed, at least, about modafinil, uh, that it isn't just about increasing the rate of firing in the prefrontal cortex, how quickly you think. Um, anecdotally, uh, there are claims that it uh, tends to enable people to have greater conceptual thinking, to be able to integrate multiple streams of thought that enable them to uh, be more creative. There's no good data on this at right, all, so to be anecdotal. absolutely it's clear. Anecdotal. That's why I say it's anecdotal. <laughs> yeah. There is no good data on this. We were discussing this. that. I had a colleague at the BBC made a film about this, and he found that it really he really suffered taking modafinil, but you were saying perhaps yeah. he took too high of a dose. But He might have, right? But I mean, so it's, it's completely anecdotal, but if you, you know, they've done polls on this, and that's the claim. And I say that only to say, it's not clear what these drugs are doing. It's not always the case that it's just meant to target wakefulness um, and that it comes at the cost of creativity uh, and other forms of intelligence. And when people talk about the broad concepts of enhancement, they include things like taking propanolol, which is a beta blocker that a lot of actors take before going on stage, which decreases their anxiety and enables mm -hmm. them to perform better. And so I think if we think about enhancements much more broadly, enhancing social functions and enhancing personal functions, um, that's a much broader class of types of things that people are doing. I just want to add, it is, the, it is just a problem for me that anecdotes, as you yes. point out here, uh, sometimes um, communicated via YouTube videos, uh, gets a, full, a, a whole generation of youngsters to do something yeah. yes. totally yeah. undocumented. It really pisses me off. Fair and enough. And it's a, it's Fair really, enough. and we see it all over the case. We see it with yeah. cannabis now. Yeah. You now we can start that discussion. It's, <laughs> it's anecdotal. Let's do and that. there's very little evidence. <laughs> and it's the same with these so-called dumb drugs or yeah. smart drugs. It's yeah. anecdotal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fiona. 
I think my question is quite uh, timely then. I would like to draw an analogy here to the, the industry of vitamins. Mm -hmm. So now, I, don't get me wrong, there, the nutrition is incredibly complicated. We, there is evidence that people do not have enough vitamins and um, definitely supplements have a place, right? I'm not saying anything that, that, that this is not medically true. However, we now have a whole snake oil industry That's that is making millions. Mm. Uh, this is completely unscientific. I have no idea how, money they're <laughs> how much millions they're making, but they are making millions <coughs> off the ignorance of pu the public. Yeah. And they're... Uh, it, you can Why talk about the uh, uh, like how effective they are. Yeah. It, it's you're relying on the consumer mm. to dig deep into into data, into boring data sets to understand how the the effectiveness of this, uh, and they are up against really uh, expensive, flashy advertising campaigns run by companies. Right. So I don't. Yeah, I think so. we have the responsibility to give people good quality mm. and easily digestible information for their, to help them make the correct decision. It's not enough to just let people, um, to throw them in there and, and force them to make their own decisions. Andrew. Yeah, so I mean, there's a planted axiom here, which is that everyone in the world is dumb. And I have a very different planted axiom, which is everyone in the world is smart. There's yes. a reason why the <laughs> value of brands is collapsing. It's because if you talk about needing to give people information, we have this incredible thing called the mobile internet. And knowledge asymmetries are collapsing, which is why people don't use accountants. They file their own taxes. It's why they don't use lawyers. They go to LegalZoom. And so it's one of the most brilliant aspects of modern life. And so this idea that YouTube videos enrage you, well, they might. But actually, consumers are smart. They see through them. They figure it out. So it's the best thing. If you so if they're so smart, why is vaccination rate dropping across well, Europe? That's not pretty yeah. smart. Uh, I, I would just challenge you on this and say, look, this argument about more information is bad goes back to pamphleteering and the invention of the printing press, when elites who feel like they can be in protected positions because they have privileged knowledge say it's terrible when other people get to find out what we already knew. Mm -hmm. So I'm highly, highly in favor of distributed knowledge architectures and allowing individual consumers to make informed decisions that work for them as individuals rather than societies in which you, you control information and to say we are, as special, clever people, going to make decisions for you because we know better. Wholeheartedly can I, agree. Can I make one <laughs> yes, go for it. It's a polemical point. Yeah. But, um, so I, I'm, I'm more of a political scientist, and I looked at the data of whether voters are well informed, and it's mm. so infinitely depressing. I'd be so much surprised <laughs> if consumers are, 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 are more informed. But totally agree. Right, but yeah. I mean, the fact that they're not that well informed is all the more reason to empower them with information so that they can make choices. When you said um, we shouldn't uh, force consumers to make a choice, I want to challenge you to say. Force consumers to dig deep into very complex But why data not? Sets. I mean, who, who is more invested because in your health than yourself? Who right. is more invested as, in figuring out for you I what's right than yourself? I know how difficult analysis oh, is, right? Mm. And I'm just, what I'm saying is that it's very difficult. I'm not saying that people are dumb. That's exactly the opposite. I'm saying they are time challenged. And if mm. they have to make complex decisions <laughs> every time they go to the supermarket to choose a vitamin or to choose a smart drug or to make a decision yeah. about their child or themselves, to get a job, to pass an exam, you're adding to that cognitive load in a way yeah. that isn't necessarily healthy for anyone. Yeah. And Potion has a comment. It's not just about, I'm not claiming that consumers are dumb. It's not about <laughs> at all, I never said that. Uh, and I think consumers are pretty smart. But yeah. ha however, I would like to, if I am ever having brain surgery, I prefer an educated sur brain Sorry. surgeon to do so, yeah. not just my neighbor who's not. Mm -hmm. all right? And if you are going to make choices about complicated medicine, uh, and, and you have to make choices about that. You prefer to have someone to guide you and help you. And, and if there are uh, damages, potential problems for public health, you need regulators to do so. Yeah. This is not about, it's not either or. It's not I'm not polarized. trying to put you out of a job, I polarized. agree. <laughs> but, 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 but you know, it's, it's, these are complex choices. These yes. are complex decisions. We have a question, Koshin. Hi, I'm, I'm Po Shen Lo. I'm with the Young Scientists. I'm a math professor at Carnegie Mellon University. <laughs> I'm actually also the national coach of the United States International Math Olympiad team, speaking of Olympic competitions and yes. intellectual <laughs> pursuits. I was also one of the people who raised my hand saying that I know of people who have taken <laughs> such drugs. Um, and when we talk about multiple choice exams, these are extraordinary, compl extraordinarily complicated exams requiring in immense creativity. Um, there is a correlation of well, there are some gold medals that have gone along here too. But the, the thing I want to talk about is in support of the regulation. I want to challenge this notion of good. 
Because actually, I'll relate a conversation I had uh, over lunch with some extremely distinguished mathematics researchers. They were not kids, they were adults, they were ERC grant recipients. They, they, they are very distinguished intellectuals about this hypothetical question. Suppose there was a smart drug that would take 10 years off your life, but you would then have successfully published one of the leading results and become famous. Would you take it? Now, among this group of esteemed individuals, there was not a consensus in the sense that some said, yes, I would take 10 years off my life to do this. The notion of good is very complicated because now I'm going to take the next extreme and say, uh, why do they want to do this? It's for the great pleasure. Now, the heroin addict, they don't mind apparently taking 50 years off their life for a feeling of pleasure that is probably more intense than winning a Nobel Prize. Would you support that as well? Need it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so heroin's an easier case for me. Uh, and I will say no, I would not support enabling free and easy access to drugs like heroin. Um, but, uh, but I think that the, the conundrum is one that we talk about in philosophy a lot, which is um, this idea of personal choice, right? I mean, people have done it in the extreme to say if you could have one day of absolute exquisite pleasure, a kind of utopia that you never could have imagined otherwise, um, and you would die at the end of that day, would you take that drug? And some people say yes. Uh, and, you know, in a very individualized society, right, a libertarian society rather than a more communitarian society, um, you know, should you enable the person to make that choice, the answer, if you were following a very strict libertarian approach, would be yes. A communitarian approach would probably say no to that because, um, you know, the effect on the community and society is too great. It's not worth it. Um, where I live, personally, is somewhere in between, which is it's a balance between individual and the society, and you have to find the right balance. Mm -hmm. And there are certain drugs that are so destructive to society, like heroin, that absolutely we need to regulate them. I believe we need regulators, and I believe we need Thank regulators. You. <laughs> You're welcome. I, need, I believe we need regulators in order to serve an information forcing function. And the question, really, in this enhancement debate is what information is relevant? Um, and you know, we agree that it may need to be a new paradigm, a new framework to be able to determine what's the relevant information, because traditional efficacy, you know, in this example and in other examples, is very different when it's personal values, mm -hmm. um, and it's harder to measure because how do you quantify improved performance? A a sense of well-being, a sense of joy, a and sense of happiness. And as we've clearly right. heard. It That's depends right. on the society you're living in. So That's you would right. need different paradigms from different right. regions, I, I would assume. That's right, and, and, yeah. And, and just on, on this issue, it wouldn't just be the, in, in a more kind of communitarian or Confucian society, it wouldn't just be the individual who decides to sacrifice their life or increase pleasure or even writing a great paper. You'd also have to ask the parents what they think. And if, right. if the elderly mother isn't in favor of my dying after one day instant <laughs> pleasure, then yeah. maybe I shouldn't have that right. Yeah. Right. Great. Are there any further questions? Anybody? I think we're running close to the end of the session. Oh, sorry, sorry. Go on. I see it. Asmar Raj here, I'm from Saudi Arabia. Um, I'm going to go back to the regulation part. Uh, the more regulation, the more there is a black market. I know my country, uh, school is very competitive, and on the test uh, time where the exams, there is, uh, it's famous that Keptagon is, or, or other pills of some street names are more uh, sold at these times, and then many kids go to hospitals for these pills. So. If, it was, if there was a regular regulation to these pills, people would probably take the good ones, not the ones that sold on the street, which are poison or something else. Mm. Yeah, so, I mean, that's another reason why I believe in regulation, because regulation is not part about safety and efficacy. We talk about that. It's also about the quality of what's inside the, the, the stuff you're actually taking. And I'm a deep believer in, and I've, I've seen the results, if you don't, that you know what's inside. So if you, if you have a regulate, regulatory paradigm by which you say these here are okay to take, and actually we demand that the manufacturers put in it what they claim they have in it, we're in a, we're in a better position. But this will require more than the 10 minutes or five minutes we have left to develop mm -hmm. such a new Good paradigm minutes, so. <laughs> of, of, uh, of regulation. I still believe in regulation, but I think we, it's a continuum. It's a, it's, of course, you don't, I don't want to regulate coffee by all means, but I do want to make sure that you don't give so-called smart drugs, and we call, just the fact that they're called smart drugs shows that we need more regulation, at least more debate about it, because some of them may be good, and we don't know what good means, because that's contextually de decided, mm -hmm. and some of them may be harmful, and that's why I don't think they're smart yet, at least. Okay, so we've got about 10 minutes left. Oh, go ahead, Janet. That's right. Thank you. Yeah. 
actually just building on the heroin thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was just yeah. thinking a little bit about, we're talking about, you talked about individualism versus community, right? And so yeah. the community effects of heroin are really bad. And it's not just a, a case of someone dies, they have children and blah, blah, blah. There's also the supply chain effect, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of bad that happens in the quest of getting heroin from yeah. X mm. to Y. Um, what about these smart drugs? What does the supply chain look like for Ritalin? For, I mean, yeah. caffeine, there's lots of issues in the supply chain of caffeine. Yeah, you know, yeah. when we think about self-driving cars, we're thinking about cobalt and the issues with the supply chain of cobalt. And actually, mm -hmm. is it really a good thing to keep having electronics? What's the deal with smart drugs? If you have higher demand, what happens to supply chain? Well, I mean, we already have a black market for smart drugs, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the challenge, and I took your question to be slightly different, which was... Um, <laughs> You know, it's, it's incredibly important that we know what's in the drugs, right? So that's one value that regulators provide. They provide many. But um, one value that they provide, right, is to, to do quality control and quality testing. But, um, you know, the, the risk of regulation is that it can drive a black market as well. Um, and, you know, you see in college campuses around the U.S. that there's a black market for Ritalin and for, you know, these kinds of drugs. Um, and, you know, you have students who have access to physicians who may be willing to prescribe it, even though they may not have the indication because they have wealthy or families who are able to afford them going and, you know, getting the drugs. And then you have this black market that develops on college campuses, and so you have this significant distribution problem as well. And then a great question of what is the quality? Are they getting, you know, the right drugs? What are the effects of it? Nobody's monitoring them. You know, many of, especially the class of drugs for ADHD, do have significant effects because they're stimulants. And the stimulants can be problematic and they need to be appropriately regulated for the correct dosage and for, you know, monitoring of the different health effects that they have on the body. And so, um, you know, the finding the right balance, right, which is understanding that anytime something may have efficacy or perceived efficacy, um, Overregulation can lead to a black market, which can create more insidious effects, and the supply chain looks quite dangerous in those instances. Um, you know, you have uh, people pulverizing these drugs and mixing them with other things, and who knows what the safety of the things are that they're, you know, mixing them in with. Um, so, black markets are far more dangerous than open markets, um, and how you find the right balance and regulation so that you don't create a black market is, is a really wonderful question as well. Can I just make a go? So we're spending a lot of time now. We've, 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 we've got into this very deep conversation about using drugs for cognitive enhancement. And what I would say is, okay, diet, mm -hmm. exercise, yeah. rest, mm -hmm. medicine. They're, they're all drugs that affect your cognition. Are they drugs, though? Well, to the extent that they um, have effects on, on your brain and its performance, yeah. and your, uh, then in my view, they have very similar effects. Now, okay, maybe technically they're not drugs because they're not going to get regulated the way a drug would be regulated. But um, this notion that, for example, and I think this is very problematic, that you can actually turn these things into highly regulated products that are then highly valued and where industries then start to pump and promote them is very problematic to me when there are much simpler ways in which we could think about creating much broader, very positive population, population mm -hmm. of Effects around how people enhance their ability to live well in modern life, and so I mean, surely that's the answer. Well, they're not mutually exclusive. Of course, right. you want to do that, but then if there are drugs that have either dangerous or unfair effects, then we might still think about regulating them. Right? Well, or if yeah. they have positive effects, I mean, mm -hmm. it's not as if you know I'm suggesting that you don't exercise or that you don't do neurofeedback or meditation or other you know improve your diet, mm -hmm. which are all more effective right now than mm -hmm. any drug that's, that's out there correct. for cognitive enhancement. Mm -hmm. But if you also get on a plane you know, to China and have a 12 hour time difference and going for a run first thing in the morning doesn't keep you awake for the next 12 hours and a dose of modafinil that does. Work for you? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but a dose of modafinil does, then I mean, yeah. why isn't that part of your overall strategy for. Is that not just a shortcut that feels like, I don't know if it's. It feels like maybe that brings less meaning if that's such a thing. Well, I mean, it, it, it helps me show up, so that's meaningful. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I, think, I think all of these things all of these things are fine. I just don't think that there are so many people, perhaps like you, who get on a plane for 12 hours, come to China, and appear <laughs> bright as a button on a stage um, <laughs> with, with the kind of energy and, and vim that you're d displaying. And so, look, um, that's great. And I'm, I want to know actually it's what It's the you, medafinal. No, it's I actually don't I want to know it's good, but... <laughs> I wish I had some with me on this trip, but, but no, yeah. But... but but just more broadly, um, uh, when one thinks about it, because you asked about this as being a new norm, and we talked about, for example, kids on college campuses. I have five children. Yeah. Um, two have graduated, uh, two are in college, and one's in high school. And so um, these are things I look at a lot because uh, are I they look taking at, these drugs? You know, well, no, no, you're uh, aware of it. 
Uh, let's put it to you this way. Not, none, of, none of my children have prescriptions for these kinds of products, but they all, all of these young people um, have, in my view, pretty interesting lifestyles when it comes to, for example, they get n not nearly enough uh, sleep when they're in college. Uh, they consume vastly too much alcohol when they're in college. Right. Um, they tend to exercise, and they have all kinds of other fun activities. And so um, uh, I think there's a whole conversation that has to be had about the culture, for example, of, of college life and campuses yeah. Yeah. that should go well beyond this idea of are you taking no-dose or um, uh, modafinil? I think that's that actually that just framing the conversation that way is problematic. Yeah. I agree. I think it's a holistic set of options and understanding where it fits within that holistic set of options is important and valuable. And especially people understanding that today most of those drugs are not as effective as any of the other interventions exactly. that you might use yes. to improve your cognition, your memory, your wakefulness, yep. etc. That's why I call them dumb drugs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question, Sangha. You have a question. As, as a college professor um, in, uh, in, in neurosciences um, in Korea, uh, which is, and, and I just moved to Korea about a year ago and realized how stressed out and, perf you know, and kind of performance driven all the students are there. I think it's really actually highly dangerous for people like us in a forum like this to be calling things like, cognitive enhancing drugs or smart totally drugs. Agree. Even that terminology really worries me because if it gets out there and yes, students pick yes. up on these things, um, given the unknown long-term effects and societal effects, and I could <laughs> already like imagine like Korean moms going crazy to find out more <laughs> about these smart drugs yeah. uh, for their co college entrance exams. Uh, yeah. I think we have to be much more careful, even in the way we talk about it yeah. uh, at this forum. You have a there. question back there. And one more over here, yep. Yeah. I've got a microphone here. We've got about three minutes left, so got, go ahead. Um, my name's Kristen, I'm also a scientist. You guys are <laughs> surrounded by scientists in here, which is a <laughs> high pressure situation. Um, I wanted to build on what you were saying and point out that some of what people are seeking with cognitive enhancement is actually um, risk recovery from or escape from mental illness. And a lot of what's happening in uh, pharmaceuticals for mental illness is, is not, the drugs are not working. But people are solving their own problems with things like N-acetylcysteine and inositol and GABA. So, when we're looking to enhance people who are healthy um, and, and thinking negatively about it, we also have to keep in mind that the same jump may be what people are using to get out of really crippling and paralyzing situations. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. a good point. So I think that's about all the time that we have left. I just wanted to take a quick show of hands after hearing that discussion. Try and be honest and say, would you now think about taking a smart drug in your, in your life to enhance a lot of shaking heads, one, <laughs> two. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so that's great. So thanks, everybody, for coming to the session. It was an absolute pleasure to have the discussion, and I hope you enjoyed it anyway. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you.